talk through this or should I talk through my microphone? I'm not too sure. The mic's fine. Okay. Everyone else? Are you not as well? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, like Sammy said, like I traditionally do events on the other side of the world because that's where I'm based. But um, I guess it was really important for me to kind of group everybody together um, just because, you know, when I was here, there wasn't really stuff like this happening. Um, and I think, you know, being in the UK has kind of opened my eyes up to like how community like and unity can really like amplify the culture and amplify the people and amplify our message. Um, so yeah, just thank you so much for coming. Um, and we've got an amazing panel. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with some of these people, but we've got Chris Fox. Woo! Woo! And we've got Saray De Silva. Yes! <laughs> and we've got Latifa Dow. And we also have Mega Kapoor. Is Mega with us? Hi, Mega! Yes. Hi, hi! So Mega is going to be chatting to us from Sydney. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, shall, we get, shall we get started? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Anyone got any questions? Do we need a space okay. out now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can everyone see us all right? Okay. Okay, so I um, guess I'll just start by introducing myself. Like, I know I know some of you, I don't know some of you, uh, but I'm Anita, I am from Pukekohe, um, and I now live in London, and since going to London, I created Diet Parata, which is, it's, like an, it's, a, it's an Instagram platform, but it's much more than that to a lot of people. Um, it's a community. Uh, that celebrates the best of the best in South Asian talent and creativity. Uh, I did graphic design at AUT uh, and I really just started in advertising here, started freelancing and then just kind of took those skills and then just, I basically applied what I was doing for other people to myself to create this brand. So that's me. I'm gonna get um, I'm gonna get the girls to introduce this themselves because I just don't know if I can do them justice. Um, Chris, do you want to tell yeah, us a bit, a bit sure. about you? Sure. I'm just gonna see if my mic is on. Okay, good. Hello, hi everyone. Um, I'm Chris. Chris Fox. I was born in Lotoka, Fiji. I'm a South Indian, Indigenous Fijian. I came to Auckland when I was two was raised out west, so any Westies, shout out to y'all. Um, <laughs> I went to university, I majored in digital media, and that kind of helped me get into my world of content creation, which is what I do. I do vlogs on YouTube, I do lifestyle, I do, I do makeup, I do beauty, and that kind of just, yeah, my degree basically was a stepping stone towards helping me um, get to where I am today. And that's me. Amazing. So, right? Hi. Um, I'm Sarayd. Um I was born in Kirikiriroa, but I sort of grew up all over, everywhere, I kind of moved every few years. Um, I make a podcast, and I do voiceovers, and I do some writing, that's kind of my jobs. God, there's so many people here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I make a podcast called Conversations with My Immigrant Parents with Julie, who's here. Um, I guess I'm mostly interested in those kinds of stories anyway. That's the kind of work that I write about, this kind of stuff I write about as well. Um, I'm Sri Lankan and Pakeha, and really happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Saray. And Latifa. Hi, everyone. I'm Latifa. Um, so I was born and raised here in Auckland. I come from a, a Gujarati background, a Gujarati Muslim background. Um, my father is from Fiji. My mum was Gujarati born in New Zealand and then um, grew up in Mount Ross School in Linfield. Um, I studied a Bachelor of Arts at Auckland Uni in English Literature and then I went to AUT and did my um, post-grad in journalism um, and done a bit of comms and uh, project coordination work. Um, recently just 
resigned without a backup plan from Amazing. my yeah. We love that. that. <laughs> um, council. Um, just, yeah, part of the great resignation, I guess. Um, and just finding my way, I guess, and doing some consulting with the Vida. Fantastic. And we've got Mega up here. Hi everyone, this feels so surreal, should be used to it by now. Um, my name's Mega Kapoor, I um, was born in India and then we moved to New Zealand when I was very young, grew up in Linfield, Mount Ross School and then gosh, went to school in Auckland, then moved away to Melbourne for uni, um, did law, quickly realised that was never going to be for me. Um, I think I cold called the editor of Vogue India then and said, can I have an internship? And she was so confused. She was like, okay, who is this person with a Kiwi accent just randomly calling me? So I ended up there and I guess my journey in fashion started there. Um, I'm currently bit of a full circle situation I'm back as editor of Vogue India my three month anniversary re working remotely today and then before that I had my own magazine called Imprint um, which you know I guess was a love of my life in a way so it's been a bit of a, a bit of a transition working for someone else and not doing my own thing but really really happy to be there with you um, even if it is remotely. Oh, thanks, Mega. We miss you in person, but so happy that you can join us digitally. Okay, so um, I just wanted to ask you all, do you remember South Asian representation as a kid? Like, what if, I mean, if you did, if you didn't, or well, what did heroes look like to you on mainstream media? Personally, no. I didn't see any representation that I could relate to growing up. Um, whether it be mainstream media or in, you know, magazines or anything, I didn't see anything. So, yeah. I thought Aladdin was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I now I don't too. actually I don't think, know. I don't think it is. I think it but I don't think they knew either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was, ba that was basically it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, not really, not much. Um, you know, being Muslim, representations of me were not what I um, related to, obviously, and was not familiar to me. So, um, yeah, no, not really, not much. How about you, Mega? Yeah, no, no, <laughs> it's just a big fat no. There was not really any, um, yeah, it's yeah, a bit sad to say, but really, like growing up in New Zealand, at, what, what, I w I'm 36 now, so there was not really anyone that like me or you know that I could relate to in that way um in New Zealand no sadly no okay that's sad state of affairs um I think well what did heroes look like to you then could you relate to any other types of people like for me personally you know we really loved like Destiny's Child, Bear Witch, all that sort of stuff but it wasn't it was really Destiny's Child that kind of like hit the nail on the head because they were brown you know and they were cool and they were a girl group and it kind of just like that glimmer of hope although you couldn't really like hold on to it from a cultural standpoint it was just like that representation of skin color mm. so for me you know again no but um destiny's child was kind of like the closest thing to that otherwise i felt like they were really negative representations like you know just stereotypical uh, roles like a poo from The Simpsons or um, you voiced know, by a white man. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and there was that as well, or like you know the stereotypical roles of shopkeepers or mm. cab drivers or whatnot. So growing up, like in saying that, you obviously didn't. We obviously didn't really feel like we saw ourselves reflected back to us and what we're consuming. How did, did you ever feel like growing up South Asian impacted your confidence? I, um, I moved to Christchurch when I was 14. Oh. Mm. And there we go. <laughs> Spill the tea. From living like all around um, the North Island basically, then I moved to Christchurch. Um, and because I was raised by my mum and my grandmother, my grandmother's Singaporean Indian, my mum's obviously Indian and Sri Lankan. Um, they basically told me I was white, and then I got to Christchurch, and everyone in Christchurch was like, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, you cannot sit with us. You are not what you think you are, I don't know. 
It was just like the most jarring, scary thing. And it was so normal there to talk about brown people in this way. Mm. So yeah, at that point, it fucked me up being South Asian. But prior to that, it had not been so difficult, obviously, because I'm half white, that made it easier. But um, yeah. Absolutely. I think for me personally, um, growing up in Auckland, I always got picked on for being like Indian and you know, everyone in class would say things that were like, that had a racist, racist connotation behind it. So for me growing up in that environment, I like thought, I was like, oh shit, like, oh, it must be embarrassing to be like Indian or like, why is everyone mocking me and like saying, like doing shitty accents and like taking the piss out of my culture. So I growing up thought I was kind of ashamed of being Indian. And then as I grew older, I was like, hold the fuck up. Yes. Who the fuck? Like, you know, people will call me names and make, fu make fun of my mum, like rolling up my rotis for lunch. And like, you know, my lunch would be completely different to everyone else's. Mm. They're having their boring ass butter on their bread with their <laughs> unseasoned. I'm sorry, but it's giving cheese and unseasoned. Yeah. But mine was giving amazing curry wrapped in a roti. And then everyone was like trying to mock me for that. So in a way, as I grew older, I was kind of like, hold on, these people have no seasoning in their food, why are they trying to mock me? I'm like, I'm yeah, going, yeah, what yeah. is this? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And then when I hit university is when I've kind of was introduced to like just a wider range of cultures and everyone didn't really judge you for who you were, where you came from, etc. And then that's what kind of built my confidence up, confidence up to being like, fuck everyone. Mm. Like, you want to come for me and my culture? I'm, I'll take you back this time around. So don't even try. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, definitely a thing about lunch. Eh? Like, I would take my dull and rice to mm. school. Yeah, and everyone would have been like, what is that? What is you that? Know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I went to private school from year seven, so one of few um, brown faces. And so definitely, like, I had to tone myself down to, you know, fit in. And, like, and even then, like, it, it never quite happened. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, even then, no matter how much you try to do that, it's like, you, like, it will never be enough, right? And absolutely, like, once you go to uni and then it just all changes. It all changes, yeah. It all yeah. Changes. It's crazy the mm. difference between, like, high school or intermediate high school and then you go to university and then the, the whole thing just fucking changes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mega, how about you? Yeah, I think, I think we can't discount, like, how... It was a really, for me, it felt like such a sudden shift in terms of just talking about these experiences. Um, when I look back growing up, I actually think I got into fashion because it was about finding a way to sort of cut through that, the bullshit around being different in a way. Because, you know, I think having style and fashion is kind of this way to kind of cut through people thinking that you're different or qualifying you because you're you know, a certain way or or whatnot. And I think I when I, I guess around, you know, when everything started, when culture started shifting a few years ago, which was super recent, I, I thought about it really deeply. And I was like, why, what drew me to this? And it, I think it really was initially, yes, of course, there was, a, there was an innate love of it, but I also saw that that was a way to cut through people pigeonholing me because of my um, skin color and my background and for being, different for sure yeah it's funny that you mentioned like that shift because for me like I always felt really ashamed of who I was and just growing up in like this like white world basically um and I really you know that that kind of I don't think there was like an immediate shift but I think there was a gradual shift and I think that shift was really contributed to the internet to be completely honest with you like we've got information at the tip of our fingers you know like instagram you're like consistently learning and for me like it was around 2017 which is actually when i started diet prata um and it kind of just like you know took a while to grow um but it was really around like the time the time of the reclaim the bindi movement i don't know if anyone remembers that or any if anyone's actually old enough to remember that anyone was using the internet like around then or Instagram, like, you know, in the early days, <laughs> the early days, you do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, like, that that moment for me, like, seeing people kind of, like, unify together, and, like, I really felt, like, a sense of belonging through that, although it was digitally, it really kind of, like, started the shift for me, and, like, how 
how I was saying. So everyone kind of mentioned uni um, here or there. Uh, do you do you feel like uni helped you in what you do now? <laughs> yes and no, because I did learn like my videography skills and editing and stuff to help me make my content through uni. But that's literally the only aspect that helped me and then the rest I taught myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To write? I did my undergrad in acting. Um, <laughs> no. Oh, maybe. I don't know. It was like the most traumatic period of my life, probably. I don't right. know. I'm sure other people in here have gone to drama school and they know <laughs> the vibes. Um, it's funny, like, that period that you, a lot of us, a lot of people study, like 18 to 20 and older, like you're changing so much in that time anyway, it's hard to know what it is that helps you, you know? Mm. Probably just meeting different people and being in different spaces, leaving Christchurch. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I can imagine that was a big driver. <laughs> um, yeah, I think doing an English degree, um, like, yes, it helps you with your, like, critical thinking and reading, like, cutting through the nonsense, right, and just actually um, reading through the words. Um, but also, I think it helped me to become more unapologetic about the types of books that I was reading, like, the only courses that were really available were like Jane Austen, Shakespeare, you know, and then there was like one paper on post-colonial literature and like that was kind of it. Right. Um, and so that's when I really was just like enough is enough. Like, you know, there's a whole world of books and a whole world of film and literature out there and it's just not in this institution. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, even institutions are like super whitewashed, you yeah. know? Yeah. Sure. Mega? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I went to a very, I went to law school because I thought that I was good at English. Like, I should probably do that. And maybe that would, it wasn't my parents, to be honest. Maybe it was just me trying to sort of that sort of, I don't know, South Asian, always striving for excellence thing to kind of feel like you're valid in a way. So that felt like the right course. Um, I was really bad at it, um, but then I also was really, I was really good at some aspects that were more political. Um, I don't know if it, it, it is such a formative time. And I honestly felt like I didn't, I felt like there was no choice to kind of just explore my interests or, you know, I felt like I just had to keep going and be a successful person. And that was the, the route to do that. Um, now, I think just having, having the tools, especially like when you're negotiating contracts or, you know, going, you know, working with clients as a freelancer, I look back and I'm so grateful that I have that language. And um, I had that education at the time. I probably didn't realize how, how powerful it was, but, you know, I, I wish looking back and I'm sure that a lot of other people in the room can probably relate to this is give yourself time to, I wish I had given myself time to think and really assess what, I, what, it, what it is that I really wanted out of that time um, rather than just pushing myself because, you know, that's what, it, that's what you do. And while it wasn't at the surface, you're an you're Indian girl, you have to be like, you have to do law and like, and my sister's a doctor. So like, you know, it's kind of like, um, but it was, it was more, I think it was subconscious, that thing of like cutting through if you're really, if you're really smart, if you're really good at everything, like that's what's going to cut through in this white world. For sure, for sure. So um, how do you feel like your, what do you feel like your fields look like now from a representation standpoint? Chris? I mean, you're in content creation. Mm, um, so I feel, I feel like in the main like influencer world, like of Aotearoa, there's really not that much representation when it comes mm. to like people like me. Mm. Um, when I go to events, I don't really, you never really catch me at events because I don't like going to events because it's just filled with the same salt and pepper bitches mm. that I'm like sick of. Like I, I, like I don't want to be shady, but it's like, where is all my brown girls at? Like, why am I the only brown person here? Like you go to like these events and I'm like, I'm just not comfortable here. So it's, yeah, I don't really see it that much. Yeah. Yeah. I think your work has made a really big difference to how I like interact 
and even feel using social media just because by following Diet Prata, I'm like exposed to so many, I like follow so many accounts because you post them, you know? Yeah, right, right. Or just, I mean, social media has definitely like made everything feel more hopeful just because you're so much more connected. And it's like that, you know, not just using social media as a South Asian person, but using it as a queer person. Like it mm. just feels better now. Like I can't even imagine yeah. how different it would have been <laughs> if I was young and had seen not only white queer people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's kind of like a reflection of how we grew up, you know? Like you can really kind of appreciate when you do see glimmers of hope or when mm -hmm. you do really see like a community or a space trying to like really pushing the dial forward. Mm. Mm. How do you feel your field looks, Latifah, at the Auckland Council? <laughs> What's that looking like? Um, well, I'm not there anymore. Yeah. Um, no, um, I, yeah, I don't know what my field is anymore, but just in terms of digesting content, right? I think social media, you can really choose what's on your feed and I think for mm. me that has really helped me to find my voice and just say what I want to say without it being you know every little word being um what's the word like scrutinized mm -hmm. um and especially you know being Muslim um where on screen is just not real right um and yeah like for i feel like for my own mental health i have to be really careful about yeah what's on my social media exactly. otherwise it'll just like yeah, yeah. eat you alive yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Mika, how about you i think um you know Austra speaking from the australian point of view there's like you know two or three people um but I think one of the joys of sort of taking on this role is discovering like the like the breadth and the width and the immense talent of um, South Asian creators out there. So I, you know, I, I guess like that's one of my one of you know my, my biggest mandates is to connect get connect that with people in the diaspora so people in New Zealand people to understand that there's so many people out there to to look at and connect with and be inspired by but you know I guess unfortunately I probably if, if I wasn't sort of undergoing this sort of heavy amount of research and and just kind of um you know really searching for it I think sitting here in the Australian fashion industry I probably wouldn't have um yeah, I just wouldn't see enough of it, to be honest, because you do kind of exist in your own spheres of influence sometimes, whether that's deliberate or not. So, um, but I think that's a, that's a good thing. Hopefully we'll see more and more and it's encouraging just seeing you all sitting up there. Ah, very sweet. In terms of what you were saying about like seeing representation in the same kind of fields we work in, something I've noticed is that I'm hypercritical of famous South Asian people. Like I invest so much in them. And then if they disappoint me in some way, it feels like personal. That's the mm. thing. I think it's because we have so little, like we have so little stories. We have so little glimmers of representation that when we do see ourselves reflected back, we expect all of our hopes and dreams to be answered in that one person's story. Mm -hmm. Great example of that was Never Have I Ever, mm -hmm. right? Like that is one person's story. And I saw that shit get ripped to shreds, you know? And Mindy, she's really done what no one else has ever done before. Love her or hate her, right? And obviously, you know, there, was, there were like problematic aspects as to like that, that show. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're familiar with it but you know it's just that thing about kind of like holding when you do see South Asian people they're held on the highest pedestal and it's kind of like almost I don't want to say counteractive to like pushing the culture forward but we are hypercritical and yeah. it is it mm -hmm. is I mean I've had to train myself of getting out of that and just under, I think it's about like kind of taking a step back almost and like realizing like this is actually someone else's story. There are actually other people out there. Do you know what I mean? Um, so we know that, like, if it, if someone else fucks it up, it's harder for the next person to come through or we perceive it that way, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's why, like, 
I think, you know, cancel culture, I really like not so much into that. I think the premise of Diet Prata is, well, it's a play on Diet Prata to start with, which is a platform, uh, you know, that cancels the people, but Diet Prata is really about celebrating the people. And I think, you know, when you do concentrate on stories that are more celebratory, it, it feels better, mm. you know, especially managing a community mm. like that as well. So let's talk about careers. I guess, like, what do you feel, how do you feel, uh, what do you feel the challenges were in your careers? Like, for me, you know, I am come from advertising and all my bosses are white. Senior management is white. They're all white, basically. And these are the people that are responsible for communicating some, you know, ideas for some of the biggest brands to the world. And so, you know, when you don't have diversity on the inside, you're sure as hell not getting it on the outside because, you know, stories aren't being told in an authentic way. So for me, it was really the lack of black, indigenous, and people of color in advertising industries Um, And also the lack of support for the leaders that actually do identify as black, indigenous, or people of color. It's kind of like, even when you get to the top, you know, it's hard to make a difference because you're just, you're you're fighting, you're fighting against it. So what did challenges look like for you in, in your career? I think seeing like how like the entertainment industry from the inside is more depressing than it is from the outside, I think. Like there's still, the money still goes to white people even if there's a few people of color playing like certain roles on TV. I started, um, when I graduated from drama school, I started working in theater. And even the theater industry is like the most, so the most low paid form of um, performing actually Dance is pretty shit too, but um, like a very, you know, gr- like independent theatre, grassroots level, no one's making any money, and it's still all white. Yeah. Like if you can't even, I mean, not as much now, but if you can't even kind of get that fixed, it feels, and then the further you go, the more money there is, the wider it is, and sometimes you get a role, but the person writing your lines is still white, and everyone mm-hmm. you're performing against is still white, the directors are still white, Sometimes I've been on set and people don't say my name right for three days and like that's been pretty shit. Doing stuff that is self-directed has been so much more inspiring and interesting for me. For sure. What do challenges look like in your career, Chris? I feel like support wrapped around like working with someone like me, for example. Um, you know what you're going to get. Do your research before you want to try and work with someone like me and don't try and fall me into being your PC basic bitch so you know I don't want to be told what to do or how to act in a certain way as well as in my industry as well um, I've had experiences where me and another influencer are doing the exact same thing um, and I'm not trying to like tip my own horn or anything do you know what I mean but like from a naked eye you see that like for example, I'm the one with the most engagement, right? I'm the one of color, I'm popping, I'm, you know, and then the other person is just there, but just under me, but she's white, she's blonde, she's got blue eyes, but they offer her 10% more. Yeah. So it's like, what, what, hold on, I'm sorry, what? Um, who's the one with the most, you know, engagement here, so why is she getting more than, you know? So it's just little things like that that I've had to deal with in the past where I've had to kind of fight for more um, in terms of my value um, and who I am. Um, so yeah. Latifa? Um, for me, like in, in roles that I've had, um, the, the biggest challenge has really just been able to be myself. You know, like, um, I can't eat this. Oh, but why? You know, mm-hmm. like, I just, I don't want to eat it. Like, just don't ask me. Like, I'm, I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to drink it. Like, just stop shoving it down my throat, you know? Exactly. Um, and the amount of energy that it takes to explain that right over and over again from a ener- cultural standpoint from a co- yeah it's just energy that you could be using to do your job that you right. to do yeah, 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 you know yeah, yeah, what yeah, I mean yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I'd rather just eat what I want to eat mm-hmm. and do my job and go home exactly. you know what I mean yeah. 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 and 
Mika, what did challenges look like in fashion for you? Um, God, what isn't a challenge? Um, <laughs> I think you just, you know, whether it's like direct or indirect, I'm sure, as you all know, I think you just kind of have to work as a person of colour, like working in these spaces, you just have to be like, I call it 25% better than everyone else to get the same recognition. Yeah. Uh, I truly, truly believe that. And, you know, one of the, you know, one thing that I found, it's it's funny what validates you to other people. Um, you know, I think the proud, I'm so proud of Imprint because that was really something I did to create my own culture, to create my own. I had some pretty toxic experiences, but I love what I do. So I created something that was about championing, you know, the people I wanted to champion and, and just creating like, and then, you know, it, it takes getting a job like Vogue for people to really be like, oh, you must've been doing something, um, which, you know, is a bit bittersweet. Um, I think the other thing that I, I really struggle with is that, um, you know, being Indian and identifying it as Indian, it's, it's how, how Indian you have to be to the performative aspect of some of the creators that I see who really feel like they have to play it up and whether that's by choice or not, just what perhaps, you know, some of the Western markets, what they want us to be like. I, you know, was asked to do a TV show and they like, just saw my story and the way they wanted to kind of ham up like I was like I I'm I am Indian you don't you don't need me like sifting through a shawl or you know you know what I mean <laughs> I'm so okay. this ridiculous sort of um you know stereotyping that still happens and this was you know this was for the ABC and, and I was like really like come on be a bit more nuanced than that like we can tell stories without having to kind of I still feel like there's a lot of stereotyping that goes on they want that kind of oh we want your your hard immigrant story and we want this and like you know like and it's like it's part of who I am it doesn't it doesn't relate to um you know yeah you know sifting through a shawl or like touching a sari on screen so that's something that I find really frustrating yeah absolutely I think the premise of diet writer it exists so brown people can just be good at what they do I mean like I know a lot of you follow the feed and are really familiar and I think it's just so important to note that like brown people don't have we don't have to bring our culture or our heritage or any stereotypes into what we're doing in Western spaces um, just to be palatable. But I think, I agree with you, Mega. I think that, I also think that people within the culture think that that is kind of like, could be a potential leg up perhaps. Mm. Um, Cause like, in all honesty, I probably wear a sari once every two years. It's not a big part of my identity, you know? Um, but there's so many, I mean, yeah, there's just so much of that sort of stuff that we see um, that kind of like, I guess has defined us for for such a long time and, and still kind of does in certain ways. Yeah, because, you know, I do feel like, and I'm sure you all can, really, you know, especially when it's it, the wokeness and sort of people ticking off diversity on their, um, you know, from their client sheet so that they look a certain way. I, I did a big job for a big brand. Um, I won't name it before I sort of, and it was just kind of, it was just pathetic how, like, they, you know, like the, they couldn't pronounce people's names. The way they were talking about the talent was just so off. Like, you know, there was 50 of us in this pre-production. They were, I was the only person of color and the whole peg was about diversity. And um, I still think there's, you know, like you were saying, we need more people on the inside. So we're actually representing in an innate way rather than a performative way. Um, yeah, cause I find that it's, it's super, super frustrating. It makes me angry to be honest. Absolutely. Sometimes I get, I totally understand that. And sometimes I get frustrated when I feel like white people learned the right words without doing the right thing. Yeah. yeah. But they say the things and it's like they're hiding or like, you know, productions are hiding under something else. But in the back, it's still exactly what you're saying. It's still, it hasn't changed. I think that's like performative activism versus mm. true allyship, right? Yeah. And at the end of the day, like, we should be the ones telling our own stories, you know? We should be benefiting from that, um, from a representation standpoint, but also a financial standpoint, you know? Like, behind, behind the scenes and in front of the camera. Okay, so we've just spoken about, I guess, challenges in our career. 
Um, I guess I really want to know who are people that have helped you all in your careers? Like, um, for me, diet price has been written about in some of the biggest publications in the world, and that is just because of other South Asian people. Vogue, Dazed, Kaisnabiety. And I think that really reflects the importance of, you know, having a di- like having diversity on the inside. Like, white people, or even other people for that matter, they actually don't give a fuck about whether our stories are told or not. So for me, like having people like that push diet pride forward on the inside, and the inside has been like, it's been like crucial to like where you see diet pride now, you know, because they have literal skin in the game. It's, it's important for those stories to be told. Tanisha, you're a great example of that. You did that for me, you know? Um, so who are people that have helped you in your careers? Um, I would say people who have um, put my name forward for opportunities, you know, like where I wouldn't have done so myself. A hundred percent. You know, and um, like family members, um, people that I know, like friends, people who have stronger networks than I do um, Mm. and who actually um, believe in what you, what, believe in your voice, right, and what you need to say. Um, yeah, because I kind of would have done that myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I second that, for sure. Yeah. Mega? Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, it's been my family, to be honest, um, just to just to be supportive and unquestioning about whatever weird decisions I'm making with my career. Um, and then I, you know, I was, I, I sort of had a really, really hard time. I after I left Vogue, I went to Oyster Magazine, which I think is still around. It's like an indie publication and that was pretty full on. And then I sort of dipped out and was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And then that's when Imprint started. My old editor from Vogue, Kirsty, was really supportive. She was like, I believe in what you're doing, which really pushed me forward. Um, And then outside of that, to be honest, I was lucky enough to have like Chanel and Hermes come on board and say, we believe in what you're doing. But I, unfortunately, because just the um, landscape of, there wasn't really any other people of colour to really like talk to and have these conversations about. And I honestly, I don't think if I had had the backing of like, you know, some quite major influence, but it wasn't the local industry as such. It was more it was more having these heavy hitting brands saying we believe international brands saying we believe in you that was like, okay, well, maybe I can do this. Um, but you know, I have to say it came from my family first. I I was kind of similar actually, but I felt like it was a bit bittersweet for me having international backing, for example, like Burberry, Gucci, by Redo. I really felt like I've been pushing diet prices for a really long time. A lot of you know that because a lot of you follow me since like day one, but I guess it's kind of disappointing for people to only like really like have the message resonate or the importance of the message resonate when there's like a cosign from like a celebrity or like a big brand like Burberry or whatever. So it's just like, you know, it's it's really hard. Yeah, it's disappointing. It is, it is for sure. So how did you all kind of go about, everyone's really kind of started to cut, I mean, you've just started to carve your own lane. You guys are all really established and in, in, in your own paths. How did you kind of go about making that jump from, you know, leaving, leaving, leaving what you were doing, or um, kind of like like pushing something on the side? Like Saray, you're a great example of how, you know, you took um, a government grant and you made your dreams come true that way. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, um, me and Julie applied for. Um, funding to make our podcast and video series three years ago, I think. Um, and it, yeah, it's been it's been really good. It's not like full time. We do it for a few months a year, and then we both do other things. Um, but being in charge of something has been yeah really nice, and also just getting to meet families who feel like our own families. I think a little bit has been really nice and connecting with other young people who have similar trauma to us has been really nice. Um, sure. Yeah. There's definitely, because of what we were all talking about with 
people realizing now that they can make money off of our stories or that people actually want to see these stories, there is more of a market to ship them out. Um, so, you know, FYI, there's definitely NZ on air grants for more stuff like what we do out there. <laughs> yes, go and get the bag, put a pitch yeah, together. Truly. <laughs> for sure. Press? Um, I just feel like, what was the question again? Sorry. I feel like... The question was, like, how did you go about carving your own, like, lane? How did you feel? Honestly, yeah, I just that. kinda hit record on a camera and I talk shit on the yes, camera. And it the just art really of just started. Off. Yeah. For sure. But like in the beginning of my career, like I was like at uni, I was working in retail, like I was broke as shit. And then um I really had this like passion to just record myself ranting about shit that I dealt with on the daily and that's what I literally did. I was like, Okay, just push record on your webcam and just go hunt yeah. days. Um and then I did it, I took that step forward and then um, uploaded videos daily on Facebook back in 2015, um, <laughs> when that was a thing. And um, yeah, I just kind of carved my own path because nobody else was doing what I was doing. I never really saw anything. I was just like, oh, I'm just, everyone always likes when I talk shit on my Snapchat stories when I just highlight it to everyone else that's on my friends list. Um, and then it just went from there, I guess, and it grew into what it is today, which is, a whole array of crazy shit so. <laughs> for sure i think it is just like you know starting is the first yeah. step and i think that that can be really daunting like for me it wasn't until i actually started moving in the direction of like what i wanted to do where things started happening I had all these ideas for such a long time mm. but like actually starting it's such a simple act but it it, it, it works yeah you know? it does mm -hmm. latifa yeah opening a word document you know and just yeah. start writing and then um keep writing even if no and one's so, reading yeah. it just eventually someone will read it and then yeah just it just happens it's like the same concept as uni assignments you know when you like yeah. sit there and you procrastinate for hours you're like oh i'm gonna write the first sentence and then two hours later you're like oh shit i haven't written anything yeah. and then once you get started next thing you know you're done like yeah. five thousand words yeah. later you're for like sure. oh my god it becomes easier to yeah. like, jump mm -hmm. to the next step yeah Mega, how did you kind of carve your own lane, do you feel? Oh, I think like like what you're saying, just starting being naive, also just honestly getting to the point after Oyster, just being like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. It's really tough and these people are a bit fucked and I don't know, like it's just <laughs> yeah. you know, what um and then yeah, like literally I had three months off and said, No, I I love what I do. I'm just going to do it. And honestly, like, because at that stage I was still, you know, there was still this thing. If you wanted to shoot a girl, like they used to ask you, is it going to be in print or online? And you'd get the better model if it was in print. And so I just, I just lied. And I was like, yeah, it's going to be in print. And I got like yeah. Novus who was like, you know, it was kind of, was like a Australian supermodel. And I just printed it on newsprint. Um, and I was like, it was in print. And so that's kind of, <laughs> it was kind of silly and naive. And But yeah, I just think you got to take a risk and just do it. For real. So, I mean, do you feel like there's a strong link between identity and a meaningful career? Like for me, I mean, obviously the nature of what I do is like identity based. Um, so Ray, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. But you also have to, I think I was shoving my identity into projects that I didn't really have any takeaway from or any real benefit from. Like I was giving it to people who could then make money off it. Yeah. Um, so sure. then being able, even though I'm still not really making any money, <laughs> like even though it, it's still something that is ours and that belongs to us. Chris, how do you feel about um, the link between identity and having a meaningful career? Well, I think for starters, my identity has a big impact on my career, just in terms of who I am and what I represent. Um, being a trans woman as well, I represent a big community that is constantly overlooked in mainstream society. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm, it's like, mm -hmm. I think as a trans woman myself, I have, I have a responsibility on my shoulders to just exist and be in everyone's faces. And if you don't like it, we'll just deal with it. And that's just who I am. So, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wish I knew this earlier, but you really just have to be unapologetic 
Mm. You know, and you really just have to be yourself. And um, if there is a company or or whoever that doesn't see the value in it, then don't force it. Mm. Do you know? Because that's not really where you want to be anyway. For sure. Um, I think my identity probably at times has been too tied up in my career, maybe to an unhealthy level. Um, it's so important. It's been the most important thing, um, perhaps to the detriment of other things that I think you need to maintain a balance because while, while career is really important, it, it you know, you have to, that's what I'm learning anyway, as I sort of muddle my way through. Um, and I agree with what Latif is saying, like, you know, just be, be a bit unapologetic. And I think, you know, the world has gone through so much in these past two years, have your boundaries, because I don't know, like maybe I'm stereotyping here. I think we tend to like, you know, that 25%, you've got to be 25% better. You've got to work harder. You know, like, I think that can also contribute to, um, other issues that maybe we're not as open about as South Asians, like mental health and burnout and, you know, all of those sort of things. So I would just say, yes, it's been integral, but maybe not to the healthiest, <laughs> not, 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 maybe not in the healthiest way at times. Okay. So I want to talk about, you know, when we excel as South Asian people, because I feel well, I guess, what do you guys think? Do you feel like South Asians are celebrated in the same way when we excel as opposed to uh, not necessarily even just our white peers, but also peers of other races? I think, Mika, you're a great example of this in terms of New Zealand media. You are the head of editorial at Vogue India and nobody in New Zealand has written a single word about you. So that's embarrassing for the media to start with. How, how do you feel about like the way South Asian people are celebrated as opposed to that of our peers who, who don't identify as South Asian? On, I mean, I don't expect it and I never have, you know, I think, I guess objectively, like it's, it's weird when you're talking about yourself because it's like, you know, um, I, yeah, I think, I, I think, unfortunately, maybe there's still a bit of, um, I don't know if it's tall poppy syndrome, but I think maybe um, from what I understand, and it's quite a small, the fashion world is quite small from what I can see from the, from the outset. So maybe it just kind of serves itself. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I really don't care if people write about me there. Um, but it would be, I think it would be. When I think back to myself, though, as being young and like a, you know, a young per, like that would have been nice to have seen. So, yeah, perhaps there, there could be a bit of a, a wider lens drawn. But yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's definitely something, right? I mean. Maybe they, maybe they just think I'm Australian. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that would answer a few things. Um, how, how do you all feel about the way that South Asians, uh, do you feel like South Asian people are celebrated as much as other people when we achieve success? No, I feel like when, and, and when we are celebrated, it's got this like really subtle tone of like white saviour complex you know yeah. like that migrant mm. story they came here and you know and um yeah i just yeah it's it's either like sympathy or um I don't, yeah i don't know yeah i feel yeah. like often the stories are kind of spun in this sort of to fit a good immigrant narrative yeah, yeah, as well mm. yeah. do you mean like how are we celebrated in the outside world the media, or like in our yeah. own community. I, like um, I think our own communities are great at kind of like picking up, you know, you've got like platforms like Diet Price or a Daytimers and like Brown Girl Mag and there are so many of like us celebrating each other, but how are we kind of like celebrated from a wider perspective, from a mainstream media perspective, from a localised New Zealand perspective? Mm. I think it's here, here, it's still not really like cool yet to be South Asian. Yeah. I don't know if that's a, it's a hard thing to specify like mm. what being cool means, but you know, it's not really got the, 
and maybe because there's not enough South Asian people to point to and be like, oh, look at that cool, amazing person doing that cool, amazing thing, although it's changing. But, you know, until it kind of filters down and feels like that is a pronounced thing, I think it's going to be hard for a while. Yeah, I think there's certainly the people, like, doing the work. For example, yeah, yeah. Girls at Invest sitting over here, top 1.5% podcast in the world globally. Wow. So there's definitely, it's definitely, there's definitely out there. stories, you yeah. know, and I just think, you know, like Megan, you know, why, we, why is no one writing about Megan? Well, I didn't even know, Anita, that you were from Auckland. I was like, what? <laughs> when I heard your voice on the on my voice <laughs> memo, I was like, what the, what the <laughs> It's probably because no one's written about me either. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Chris? No, I, I feel like there isn't, um, in terms of, like, representation when it comes to media, like, articles and stuff even, you know? They, they, I don't see enough celebrating people doing cool things in their own little niches. Like, for Anita, for example, you know, you've done so many things and I've never, you know, they should be more highlighted on what you've done. Because for me, personally, I'd rather read about someone that's, I can relate to um, seeing, like doing amazing things and inspire me to do amazing things. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like it needs to be more of that and there is that. I think but it's ultimately I, like, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, no, but even just like, yes, like even just, you know, re representing South Asian, but also you've just done, just forget about even being South Asian. You've got an amazing platform and, you know, like I think, yeah, if I take myself, I can totally see it's frustrating. You should have been written about. You should be a mainstay in the New Zealand fashion industry, quite frankly. You know, they should be flying you there to Fashion Week. Like, it's, um, yeah, yeah. But anyway. No, I think right back <laughs> at you. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, back at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that's more from a step. Like, I think it's, I mean, what do we feel like the answer is to that? I personally think it's like having people on the inside again it's like people actually caring about telling our own stories you know um, and not so well, we need to get better here at thinking we're legitimate without having someone overseas legitimize us yeah like sure. if, if we buy into our own greatness instead of having you know an Australian publication write about it a US someone buy it you know if we make it here and make it good here then it that's the thing, and that's the power of unity and community, and like a big reason why I wanted you all in the room today. You know, like this wasn't really a public invite because uh, you know COVID or whatever would have been amazing. But I think that everybody in this room can kind of learn from one another, and there's probably a lot of faces that you either may know or you've never seen um, before. But it's really important to kind of like start creating that sort of vibe over here because it just doesn't feel like it. You know, there are obviously like amazing people amazing South Asian people doing things like prayers there to group and, and whatnot. I think, you know, for the creative community, it is all about banding together, especially with like, with the lack of like support from other people. It's just so powerful about what you can achieve. And also like just what we touched on before about not having this big brand co-sign or whatever, like, like support your people like when they're coming up, you know, because you, you just never know. So my next question is, how do you define a personalised, healthy, creative balance? For me, I've not quite got there yet. <laughs> I have a shower at three o'clock and get out of bed. And like, I think like managing my own time is quite hard. But how do you define a person? Oh, creating a healthy balance between life and, and work. And I haven't actually got there yet. Yeah, because it's, it's kind of hard. Because like. I don't know, I amp myself up when I record stuff or I get in my creative mode and then I kind of overthink and then I get stressed and then it's like a whole thing and then it falls into my personal life and it's like, shit, I need to separate the two. Yeah. And I say in my head, oh yeah, I'm gonna do it, but I, you just kind of forget and you get carried away. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out that even, that good balance between how I can separate the two and just leave it at that. Yeah, what about you? Um, no, I'm not very good at that. Mm. I'm not very good at, um, leaving the house if I have some if I have a project I don't really enjoy doing anything apart from that project till it's done mm -hmm. which isn't very sustainable but also it's really I'm only just hitting a point in my life where I'm getting paid appropriately for the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. so I think it might be better for he from here on out 
But you can't force it either. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. when you're in that creative mode, only then can you do what you do, right? You can't do it otherwise. Like so much of what I've written has been late at night and it started on the notes app on my phone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. that's when I'm like really in that mode or first thing in the morning when I'm avoiding getting out of bed. Um, yeah, and so I think it's, I just have to take advantage of those moments. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Mika, how do you define a healthy, healthy balance? Not, 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 not what I do. Um, but it's I'm trying really hard because I've realised that otherwise it's not, it's not sustainable. So I mean, I'm just trying to do little things. I'm, you know, I, I never had to do the Zoom thing so intensely before this job, and now it's like eight hours a day plus work on top of that. So I'm, it's simple things like getting outside for a walk, like talking to a real person when I get a coffee, um, trying to, I've, lately I've been trying to go to yoga. I mean, it's just like, it's, I would just really suggest, um, yeah, if anyone has the answers, just DM me, please. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Same. Same. Create a group with all of us, maybe. Um, okay, so I really wanted to touch on working for free, really. Um, I've done, personally, I think there's like a lot of, you know, you see a lot of stuff on the internet, you've got to get paid your worth. And I fully believe that, I'm not, not endorsing that. Um, but for me, I did a whole bunch of shit for free. I've done so much work for free, it's actually borderline disgusting. But I felt like, because I did stuff for free, the way I approached it, you know, was I really recognized a good opportunity and recognize when I may have been being exploited, you know, and being able to kind of justify the two. But because I worked for free, I feel like it really helped me where, where I am now, you know, like the opportunities and whatnot that I've got are because of stuff that I've done for free. And I'm not, you know, again, I'm not endorsing working for free, but I really just wanted to get your stance on that because there's so much. I just feel like, you know, say you're a makeup artist, you're probably not going to wake up one day and Burberry's on the phone wanting you to, you know, do their full campaign if you haven't kind of, like, used your resources around you and taken a chance. With, like, Raza, we really kind of, like, tapped into our friend group. I really tapped into my friend group. Stylists, photographers, people that are, are PRs, people that work in the publications and kind of, cre like, started creating together. It just comes back to, like, putting that one step in front of the other, the art of starting. So I really kind of wanted to know what your guys' thoughts were on working for free in that in that sense. I think at the start of my career, um, just in terms of working with brands, I thought it was good to build a relationship with them just so that they know that I'm really keen and I'm happy to work alongside them, especially if it's like big brands like um, YSL or um, Mac, for example, you know. I'm um, at the start, I would personally kind of build that relationship with them and then mm -hmm. you know later on down the track they're like oh we've got a fee in this and etc but at the same time i do say to other creators out there know your worth and sure. also like it doesn't it doesn't hurt to ask like you know if you think that they might have a tiny budget just be like hey like do you have a budget if they say no and you still want to you keen to work with them just be like okay that's all good i'm keen to do this for example and then just build that rapport with them um, but yeah, that's my experience on working for free. <laughs> I think like I don't, I don't, I'm not against it, but yeah. I think if it, if it works in your favour, then definitely do it. Um, yeah. yeah. I think brand work should be paid, first mm, and foremost. Yeah. You know, but I think like, um, I think there's definitely opportunities that you can start creating with your friends that mm. can kind of lead to paid work. Rob, you're a great example of that. You and Apella have done amazing shoots and now you are basically the photographers of New Zealand, you know, your, your work is amazing. But <laughs> Come I think on, it's just, bro. You know, I think it's just great to kind of like get started and get going. Mm. What do you think, Saray? Um, It depends on what, for me, it depends on what it is I'm doing. Um, if it's something that I, because I do a few different things, not by choice, but because I can't make enough money doing one of those things to live. Um, like, if it's a voiceover job, obviously I'm gonna 
be paid the mm. right amount because someone is arguing for me to get paid the right amount. Yeah. Um, I went back to uni this year slash last year and did my master's in creative writing. So if I'm doing something to do with writing that I feel, which is something I feel that I'm new at, obviously I'm more inclined to take a smaller fee. Mm. Although now I've written for quite a, I've written for a few different magazines now and like they need to have a conversation on how much they're paying writers. Yeah, some of the like bigger publications are not paying what some of the smaller publications are paying, and yeah. how do you justify that? Yeah, I yeah. think it's it's definitely a tricky one, and it's kind of like I think when you get to a certain stage in your career, you can demand a fee. But I think kind of more what I was getting at is like when you're coming up, there I think there are certainly bits and pieces that you can do not necessarily brand work, but more like in your own creative practice to kind of like, you know, if you're a photographer and you've got a model friend and you kind of all work together and, you know, like make stuff happen. What do you think, Tifa? Yeah, I think for me it's more about um, knowing how much to charge. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. that whole thing about knowing your worth, like, I have no idea. Yeah. You know, and no one ever told me or taught me that for this kind of job, this is how much you should be getting paid and so you know you end up yeah getting paid less than what you should be because yeah yeah because that's a really easy way to exploit people a hundred percent yeah 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 and how do you ensure that you know you are being paid fairly yeah. if you actually have no clue yeah and it wasn't until um yeah someone was like oh you know you should really be charging more than that, then I was like, oh, really? Like, you know, because I think, um, yeah, no one talks about, like, it's really, like, money's a very awkward topic sometimes. Mm. Yeah. For sure. Mega, mm. I mean, in the fashion world, what do you think about this? Like, generally, editorials are free, you know? Like, what, how, do you, how do you feel about working for free? Um, I mean, I did, so, like, my whole book, initially as a stylist was built on just you know creative jobs that I wanted to do and would even self-fund like forget even working for free I put money into them um I don't know I think look I think you've got to be strategic like what if something's really I'm you know again I probably did too much of it and I found even when I had agents like sometimes I even found that tricky because I felt like they were taking so sometimes it's not even about the payment, it's about protecting what you can and you can't do and what your bandwidth is. Because, you know, some of the creative jobs that I've done for free or pumped money into have given me, um, gotten me so many, like imprint, for example, you know, I pumped all my own money into that and that was all for free. And thank, and, you know, I'm um, very grateful, but all my collaborators understood my budget limitations, especially in the beginning and worked worked with me for free, but we were working towards creating something that we were all really proud of and then could, you know, op, try and leverage to get paid work. Um, I think maybe, yeah, be strategic about it. If, if you get, if it's making you angry and you're like, I don't want to be doing this for free, then don't do it. Um, that would be my, you know, there were certain brands I was doing lookbooks for and I could see they're getting stocked on at a porter and like, and I'm like, hang on, I'm still doing this for free. So, and I was like, no, this is making me feel ick. I'm going to step back from this. And um, I don't really care. Cause you know, I think with fashion, it's a lot of it's about the glory and that five minutes of like a rush when you see your image come out and, you know, maybe I'm just a bit old and grumpy, but that sort of wore off. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think I think be strategic. If, if something feels right and you feel like it's going to contribute to your book or your career or your, you know, your, your body of work, and um, then I, I would say don't write it off too quickly. I'd also say, again, hopefully I'm not showing my age too much, but I think maybe some of the younger, some of the younger kids I've come across, I think with social media feel like, they can do everything straight away and I would I would suggest that there's still something to learn from people so I wouldn't devalue that too much as well if you're especially if you're trying to break into perhaps fashion because that's just what I know um yeah I hope that answers the question it does indeed okay so I really just wanted to ask you all what makes you feel hopeful about the next generation of 
South Asian creatives or South Asian people or just the next generation of South Asians in general? That they're different to me? Yeah. Yeah. Just that I'm seeing and meeting so many different kinds of South Asian people that I never grew up around and and they seem better. Yeah. <laughs> and it's exciting because of course you want that, you know? Yeah, mm. for sure. I think even that term South Asian, like, I don't know about anyone else here, but I really didn't hear that until recently. I really wasn't aware of like the subcontinent of South Asia and like, I think being overseas really opened my eyes up to Pakistani people, Kashmiri people, Bangladeshi people, and like so, like Sri Lanka people, everyone. Mm. Here I was so kind of, I don't know, I, I don't know if it, like New Zealand skews more Indian heavy, or... Or that we just get grouped yeah, into... Yeah, even India. when casting the panel, you know, like we were trying to go far away, but it just kind of like kept kind of drawing itself, itself in. So I think just like discovery is a really important thing about the next generation, you know, not only creatively, but also like from a historical standpoint and like challenging, you know, I think it's really great that other South Asian people challenge it, biases within our own people as well. You know, we've got, we've talked so much about biases against us, but we've got a lot to address within our own people as well. There's colorism, casteism, transphobia, homophobia, there's so many things that are kind of, uh, you know, there's so many things that, that we're up against, like the state of India with like uh, the, the way that like Muslims and Hindus are pit against each other is, is awful. H how do you feel, Latifa? Um... Like what makes you hopeful for the next yeah, generation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what makes me hopeful is that I think the next generation are less willing to take bullshit the way that we were. Yeah. You know, sure. like going back sure. to my, you know, container with dal and rice. Like if someone said something about, I'd be like, oh, okay, you know, and just um, l let it go. But I think now they're more willing to call it out. Yeah. And yeah. I think that is really powerful. Do you think that's because it's more accepted to be South Asian now? Or it's more accepted not to be white. Like there's kind of this yeah, like there's, there's, a definitely of a shift. there's definitely yeah. a shift. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Especially I'm um, talking like to my little cousins yeah. who are like 14, 15 and mm. You know, they had the same lunches that I used to take, and I'd always be like, "Does anyone ever mock you?" And then they'd be like, "Oh no!" Like people are always trying to ask me to have a bite, and I'm like, "Oh, not in my day!" Like oh, people would laugh way. at me. Yeah. You guys are so yeah. lucky, you know. And I think that, especially this new generation, they're so educated and they're so outspoken, um, which I'm just so happy about because we need more people that are outspoken that have, that has like a I don't give a fuck attitude, yeah. um, and puts people in their place when they're wrong. Because yeah. um, it's all about educating others as well. They may not know that they're saying something offensive, but if you call them out there and then, you just learn from your mistake. Yeah. And hope for the better that you grow from that situation. So, yeah. I think I said to Tanisha when you interviewed me that, like, if you told me when I was 15 that it was going to be cool to be brown, I literally would have believed that the dinosaurs were coming back <laughs> before I believed that it was going to be cool to be brown. Mm. That's how, like, you know, that's how bad it was. What, what makes you feel hopeful, Sarai? Well, you just yeah. took me back to <laughs> high school, <laughs> really. Mega? Oh, um, just everything. I feel like we're at, you know, um, I feel like it is a turning point or maybe that's just where I'm at in my head. I just see so many incredible, like, incredible creators incredible talent unapologetic within india itself as well and what they're fighting against in terms of like you touched upon with the government and and you know and censorship and just you know political issues it's just um it's that's what really honestly gets me like really excited about this this job are some of the the talent that i have seen like you know, Anita, you'd know Ashish who shot the Bayredo campaign. Like there's this, this whole host of, um, you know, just creatives that are just pushing, pushing it. And I think that there's a real, there's a real voice that's coming through for South Asian creatives that, you know, something definitely we want to push it at Vogue, but there's an identity to it. And I think, especially coming from Australia, where I think, 
you know, definitely there's so much um, plagiarism and looking to other cultures and looking to, you know, like Paris and New York or what, and just kind of ripping off like the trendy photographers. What I find so inspiring is that that the the people that I'm inspired by at the moment, that they've carved out their own voice um, in amongst their own tribes. And just, it's just really inspiring, I have to say. Absolutely. So just on that, um, talking about South Asian creatives in New Zealand, mm-hmm. um, who are some, you know, maybe up and coming South Asian creatives that you want to talk about here that you'd like to shout out for me? I think Ray and Sarika, you guys are amazing makeup artists and you've done such a great job um, tonight. So so thank you for that. So how you're an amazing uh, journalist and cultural contributor. I know you've just started a new a new role and there's just like so many people in this room that are like really inspiring. I think Zenit, I don't know where you are, but Zenit's done so much, I think for South Asians in fashion. I mean, I think everyone knows who Zenet is and Zenet's actually done some really incredible stuff before she came here, you know, and really, oh, she's missed the whole thing. She's just (laughs) just stuck back in. Just saying, Zenet, like, you're probably one of the um, people, like, for me, one of the South Asian creators that really helped push the dial forward and really, like, set the tone for for other South Asian creators, including myself. So, yeah, do you guys want to shout anyone else out? Do you want me to go? Okay, I just want to shout out to Sachin yes. at the back. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but Sachin is an amazing, talented makeup artist. And I came across him on, was it Instagram? I think it was Instagram. Uh, TikTok or Instagram, it's TikTok. He does these stunning transformations. And I, I just, because when I saw him pop up on my screen, I was like, oh my God, another Indian sister. Yeah, yes, doing makeup and beauty, you know? Um, and he's just so talented. He did my makeup one time and I was, Shocked, girl. I was <laughs> shocked to poor. So shout out to Sachin. I think he's gonna. He has an amazing career ahead of him, um, and he's you know breaking down boundaries. Yes. yes gorgeous. Sorry. Um, Sarita inspires me like daily. <laughs> I'm putting their hand over their face. Um, just brave queer South Asian people make me feel very held Mm -hmm. and very safe in a way that I didn't even know I needed when I was young, so. Yeah, shout out Rorty Girl. Um, You've already said everyone that was on my mind, Ray, um, Sahar and Zenit, definitely amazing. And also, obviously like girls at Invest, just again, like what you guys have done is just like so amazing. So thank you for everything you do including Indian Feminist, which was like another like kind of pillar of like, it was around that time of the Reclaim the Bindi movement that I really saw that page kind of like taking traction and it really just kind of made me feel like, almost like self-therapized through the page, you know? Mika? Gosh, I feel a bit guilty. I wish I knew more about what was going on in terms of the South Asian creators in New Zealand, but I hope after this, I'll have more of an idea and please anyone like, reach out to me, connect with me on Instagram. I'm really interested in hearing from you. I will I will say one of the special connections I made um, was actually um, Rukaya, whose sister's up on stage right now, um, who has Fourth Street Home. And, you know, just, it's just, it was just such an organic, it just felt like just, it was like a sisterly support that we had of each other with her platform and imprint. And there was something that was just quite innate from just being you know brown girls doing our thing but um yeah I just I I have to call I don't know enough and I need to know more um so yeah please feel free to connect and yourself Anita I'm so excited to finally connect with you amazing yeah we've got some exciting stuff to come so I can't wait for that um actually just on that note that's a good point I think like a lot of us don't even actually know each other. I think that the community here is like somewhat disconnected and that's kind of like the feedback. I mean, everyone's like nodding their heads. But um, we've actually, it's really hard with the pandemic. We can't socialize, we're not meant to be chatting to each other. But um, what we're gonna do is we've got a piece of paper 
And if you want, write your Instagram name on it or your website, and we're going to email a list of everybody to follow just to try and connect people more. And um, I'm, yeah, it would be great if you guys could like, I just think that keep supporting each other, you know. Um, but that's pretty much from us. I just really want to say thank you so much to everybody, everyone that's here, the panel. You guys have been absolutely amazing. Um, I just wanted to open the floor up to questions. I don't know if anyone has any. Maybe does anyone have any questions that they want to ask anyone on the panel? No one. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the food and the drinks. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, like the connection with the vita. I guess, and I think like it's definitely it's like, worth listening to if you're a creative because Tui actually put me in touch with the Vida. Thanks for that, Tui. Um, and I was really kind of struggling here, you know, coming back. I didn't feel like brands understood me. Brands were actually asking why I should be paid, um, and it's just kind of like you know when you're up against it. I get it's really hard in New Zealand to kind of prove your worth, especially as a person of colour, you know, when there are opportunities, they're few and far between and they may be going to other people, right? But um, the Vita's just been so amazing in the sense that they've let us all come here today, um, but they've also, South Asian people have put this event on, like my auntie Marla, she's here, she made face masks, uh, my cousins, you met, you met them on the door, obviously the panel is South Asian, Ray and Sarika, they did our makeup, and then we've got Chloe over here, who um, was who's been taking the photos for us. Um, and we've also got Prince, um, who's actually just won a bunch of awards. The food here is actually amazing. I don't know if you've seen. Um, I mean, I'm sure you just like enjoyed all the food that you've just eaten. Prince has made that. He's an Indian chef, um, and he heads up downstairs at Esther. So. Yeah, I think, like, I just really want to say thank you, Sam and Cordia. You guys have just been so amazing. Um, and also, the Vidat, uh, they know that historically white space, right? And that's because of the proximity to, to yachting and, like, this whole area. But they really do want to, like, bring more people down here. But also, help, they want us to tell our stories, right? In the same way you see this event put on. South Asian people are telling their stories, but we also brought this event to you, right? So if you've got an idea, feel free to introduce yourself to Claudia and Sam, and they can help you pitch. They have money, um, obviously not for everyone. It's like about the right idea, but if you do have an idea, they can really kind of help you bring it to life um, in the same way this was brought to life. And I just don't think there's enough brands or people that kind of like are about there. I think New Zealanders, unfortunately, quite performative in that sense. I've kind of just had that vibe while I've been, I've been trying to organize this event for about six months and it only came together in the last two weeks. There, there, was, a, there was a number of reasons, you know, obviously the pandemic and whatnot, but you know, the vibe up to here, they're here to listen and they're here to really help platform the people in a way that's, I mean, I hope this has felt really authentic, but yeah, take advantage of that um, if you are a creative because it's so hard to get paid, um, but yeah. They've been amazing, so thank you so much to Sammy and Claudia and also to Tui who have made this event happen. So can we have a round of applause for them? Alright, cool. I think um, I might hand back over to Sam who's gonna like tell us how to exit, but maybe we should hand out the little things for everyone to write their details. Maybe just write your name and your Instagram down and we can just send out to everybody if you're comfortable with that. But um, yeah, thank you so much for coming everyone. And thank you Mega for joining us from Sydney. Thank you, bye. bye. You girls are amazing, thank you so much. I wish I could put on like a lit party right now but we're not allowed. <laughs> so I'm sorry, thank you for coming and um, it's been amazing having you all here.